And without further ado, I'm going to present you to a man that has uh, started this business from nothing, with no money, um, from a man who used to fly commercial planes, um, and the wonderful man himself, who's going to be our guest speaker tonight, Mr. Fabrizio Folly. Thank you, everyone. Can you hear me? Good. Okay, now I'd like to start off the evening by telling you a story. Okay, I, I, I love stories. Now, we're going to go back in history to just after the Second World War, okay, 1947, there were two teams of engineers working on a really important project. One of these teams was in the UK, and the other team was over in the United States. And what they were trying to do is they were developing an aircraft that could fly faster than the speed of sound. Now, this had never been done before. So up went these test pilots to fly these aeroplanes, and as the aeroplanes started to build up speed and get close to the speed of sound, this thing called Mac Tuck would happen, where the aeroplane would start to do this. So the pilots panicked, and they pulled back on the stick to try and bring the aircraft back up into the air, and the aircraft's wings broke, and the aircraft crashed, and the pilot died. This happened over in England, this happened over in the United States, and it kept happening over and over again. So the United States uh, test pilot uh, facility up at Edwards Air Force Base in, in, in uh, California, they approached a young man called Chuck Yeager, who you can see in the photograph, and they said, Chuck, uh, we know that a lot of your colleagues have died in that, but would you mind going up and testing uh, this X-1 aircraft? And they said, how much money would you like? And he said, well, I'm already uh, an employee of the United States Air Force, so I'm already being paid, so I'll do it. So Chuck figured out that he needed to do something different, simply because up until now, the pilots had been going up, flying this aircraft according to a conventional piloting technique to try and achieve an unconventional result. So as Chuck went up, his plane launched, the speed started to build up, and as the speed built up, Mac Tuck happened again. The aircraft started to do this. So what Chuck said to himself, he said, well, if all my colleagues did that and crashed and burned, I'm gonna do this. And as a result, he became the first man to go past the sound barrier. Chuck Yeager, his famous, he's still living today, He's a pioneer of aviation. Uh, I grew up reading about him and, and, and dreaming about this, this incredible aviator as I took to the skies at 17 years old and earned my wings before I even earned my driver's license. And just to let you know, I actually failed my driver's test the first time round. But anyway, that's, a, that's, that's another story. So, the reason why I tell you this story is because Chuck Yeager is not the first person in history to do something unconventional to achieve an unconventional result. So if we look, for example, at this quote, it's very, very interesting, talking about the wind. Aircraft, in order to get into the sky, the wind is actually opposite. They have a headwind, okay? So they're going in, in a very unconventional way. And if we look at history, we look at this gentleman over here called Christopher Columbus. At his, during his time, they thought the world was flat. He actually proved the world was round by going west, thinking he was going to India, and ended up in America. So again, he did something unconventional. These people over here, Wilbur and Orville Wright, two bicycle manufacturers, in 1903 took to the skies for the very first time, they invented the first aeroplane. Again, people that thought in an unconventional way. Now, if we move ahead in time, we come to this gentleman over here you're familiar with, Mr. Steve Jobs. Again, another person that thought outside the, the box or the cube, as you'll find out in a minute why I call it the cube. So again, another unconventional thinker. And then we have this guy over here, Elon Musk. I don't know if you've heard of this guy. You know PayPal? He was one of the inventors of PayPal. Sold that, made a lot of money, then invested it in another project called Tesla Motors, uh, named after the famous scientist Nikola Tesla. If you've never heard of Nikola Tesla, I encourage you to go on the internet and find out about that guy. Amazing stuff he came up with. He created Tesla Motors, which is the electric car. Very, very innovative car. I test drove one the other week in Preston. Absolutely fantastic. My boys at the back came with me. They really enjoyed it. I thought, this is really cool. Now you've got to buy one. Okay, guys, we will. And, um, yeah, but um, the, the cool thing about it um, is that it's very silent. It's just incredible, incredible technology. He's also launched SpaceX, another venture, where he's launching spacecraft, taking satellites up into orbit, and soon astronauts to the International Space Station. It's a complete private venture. It's going to be the first spacecraft to take up 
uh, private spacecraft to take up people, astronauts to the International Space Station. So again, another guy that's thinking in an unconventional way. So, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the TV series Star Trek. A lot of you are young, you may have not seen Star Trek The Next Generation, but I'll tell you a bit of the story. That thing that you see in the sky there, just orbiting Earth, is what's called is a Borg cube. Now the Borg are these aliens which are a mix of a cybernetic device and human beings. And what they do is they go around the universe, they land on a planet and they assimilate all the people from that planet and they link them in through cybernetic devices. Very, very interesting. And so when you think something, everybody else can hear what you're thinking. So very interesting. Now this is the world or society I reckon is becoming a bit cubed in, as I call it. So you imagine the world, instead of being the shape of a sphere, being the shape of a cube. This is a Borg. Okay, so as you can see, it's a human being with a cybernetic device attached to them. And what's happening here? You familiar with this technology? Google Eyeglass. It's already here. So these people that created the Borg in Star Trek probably came up with the idea, and then the people at Google are actually making it happen. Okay? So we are moving towards a society a bit like that. Now the Q, as I call it, and in my book that was published in 2005, which is called Your Attitude Determines Your Altitude, How to Fly Out of the Cube and Gain Your Freedom, I came up with this concept of the cube. And as you know, a cube has six sides. So let's have a look and see what the sides are. The first side is your atmosphere, and we'll go into detail of each side in a few moments. Then we have education, which is what you're receiving here at university, money, then we have media, then we have health, and then we have attitude. Now the interesting part about the cube is that the first five sides of the cube work from the outside to the inside. The only side of the cube that works from the inside to the outside, therefore the one that you control, is your attitude. So this is where attitude, mindset, as some people call it, is really, really important. And that's why the people that we discussed before, it was their mindset. It's not that Chuck Yeager was a better pilot than his colleagues that died. He had a different mindset. He asked himself a different question. He did things in a different way. So let's look at atmosphere. So as you can see, there's, there are many things around us. You've got family, there's houses, beaches, private jets. One of the things which is important in life, do not let anyone steal your dreams. There are two types of dream stealers out there, okay? Now the first type of dream stealer is this guy over here who you all recognise, as you've probably all read Harry Potter and seen the films. Now this, is, this dream stealer is very, very easy to spot and to discover because they're those people that do not want you to succeed. So they're out there, you can spot them a mile off, and so it's very easy then to decide to stay away from them. But the second type of dream stealer is the one you've got to really watch. Now this here is a herd of elephants, a family of elephants, okay? So the dream stealers you've got to really watch, and I'll tell you what happened to me. When I was growing up, my father had a very successful career in a, in a hairdressing company called Vidal Sassoon. Vidal Sassoon in the 1960s and 70s was a pioneer. He, what he did is he took architectural buildings and put them on women's hair. So he came up with all these interesting hairstyles, which is a completely different to what they were doing in hairdressing at the time. My father was fortunate enough to be one of the apprentices of Vidal Sassoon and worked his way up in the Vidal Sassoon Corporation. And uh, so when I decided I wanted to be a pilot, my grandmother on my mother's side, which was my English grandmother, on my father's side was Italian, uh, she said to me, Fabrizio, you know, your father's had a very, and he's having a very successful career in hairdressing. He's friends with Vidal Sassoon. You know what you should do? You should become a hairstylist, just like your father. I said, what do I want to be a hairstylist for? I'm not interested. I want to fly airplanes. And she kept on and on and on. Now, it's not that my grandmother didn't love me. She said those things to me because she knew that if I went down the path of, of the hairstylist, there was more guarantees that I was going to be successful than if I went down a path of aviation where no one in my family had ever flown an airplane. They'd been on airplanes, but they hadn't flown airplanes. So it was something completely new. So what she was trying to do is she was trying to 
avoid me getting into some form of pain by going down the route of the pilot. So what I'm saying is that the loved ones around you, your family, your sisters, your brothers, your friends, there may be people around you. When you come up with a business idea, they say, that is stupid. That's never going to work. Don't believe those people. That's your dream. You have to hold on to that dream. And remember that it's thanks to people that thought differently that success happened. So it's thinking outside the cube that is really, really key. So let's look on now to education. We've all been to school, university, but now a new phenomenon which is happening is that of homeschooling. I have four children sat at the back there. None of them have ever been to school in their lives. They speak two languages fluently and they're about to start to learn Mandarin Chinese. So watch that space. Now the school system is interesting. But my question is, are they telling us the truth? Now let's think of the pyramids in Egypt, for example. Now who actually built those pyramids? When I was studying ancient Egyptians in school the very first time, I think it was about nine, ten years old, I thought, well, how did these people carry those very heavy bricks and build this thing? And then I looked more into it as I got older and read more into it. And I thought, well, did these Egyptians really build the pyramids? Now I'm not telling you they didn't, but I'm asking the question, and I leave it up to you to go and find the answer. Did the Egyptians really build the pyramids? What about JFK, famous president of the United States in the 1960s, got shot? Okay, they said he was assassinated by this person that shot him, and then they discovered he had bullets in the back of his head as well. So my question is, who really shot John Kennedy? Or maybe, should I ask the question, why did they shoot him? What's the real reason why? Next thing, man on the moon. Man landed on the moon the very first time in 1969. I was two months old when man landed on the moon. Twelve men have walked on the moon, according to history. My question is, with all the technological advances we've had in the last 45 years, why is it that we haven't been back? I think there's probably two reasons. One, there's probably somebody else on there, from somewhere else. Or the second possibility could be that we actually never went. Now, whether we went to the moon or not, I'm not saying we didn't go, I'm not saying we went, but the question is, did we really go? Next question, September the 11th. You may have heard of this. Some of you may have been around when that happened. I remember that day I was due to start a new job with an airline in Manchester, flying Boeing 737s, starting in October, and then this happened, and it got delayed till February. So I remember what happened that day. And then I started to investigate. And I asked many questions, and I watched many documentaries and spoke to many people. And it didn't go the way they tell you it went. It went very differently. And the reasons are very interesting. There's always a geopolitical situation behind all these things. So geopolitics is something that we really need to study. Don't believe what the TV tells you. Don't believe what the news people tell you. Always question. Always question. And today we've got Google, we've got the internet, so we can go on there and we can find information. But beware, because there's a lot of rubbish on there as well. But you've got to have an inquisitive mind. And this is one of the criticisms I have towards the standard schooling system. They teach you to read from a book, and then they, they ask you questions from the book. What if the answers aren't in the book? What if the information that I want is not in the book? Then what happens? So the most important thing, two important things that you need to learn. Number one is how to study and how to absorb information quickly. And the second thing is to be creative. Because when you get involved in business, things aren't going to go according to the book. Things are going to go differently. Things are going to happen that you didn't expect. And now you've got to think on your feet. And when you go out there with a business idea and you pitch it to, to, to um, investors or come to people like me that maybe has money to invest, I won't be looking at the business as much as I'll be looking at you. I want to find out why you developed this, who you are, what makes you tick, what your ideas are for the future, what your goals are. They invest more in the person than in the project. So bear that one in mind. And again, the ability to think on your feet and the ability to be creative are the two most important things and the two traits that successful entrepreneurs have compared to those that are unsuccessful. Now bear in mind, not everybody succeeds every time. I've had my failures, I've had my string of failures, but when you do fail at something, you've got to ask yourself the question, what did I learn? And if you learn something from it, and I guarantee if you ask yourself that question, there'll be something that you would have picked up, something that you would have learned, and then you take that positive into the future. And you go on to the next venture, but you don't stop. Next is money. Very fascinating subject, and I always ask myself, where does the money come from? And so I did a bit of digging, and I discovered that in 1913, in the United States of America, this thing called the Federal Reserve Bank was created. Now, a lot of people think that the US dollar 
is actually printed by the US government. But it's not printed by the US government. It's pr printed by the Federal Reserve Bank. The Federal Reserve Bank is a conglomerate, it's a cartel of private banks that make the dollar. But then the dollar was linked to the gold standard. Then what happened in 1971, President Nixon decided to take the US dollar off of the gold standard. So now the Federal Reserve have the ability to print money, money at random. So when you go to a bank, for example, to ask for a mortgage, you go into the bank, you say, I want £200,000 mortgage to buy a house, please. The money is actually generated by your signature. They don't have £200,000 worth of gold sitting in the vault. Because that the currency, the pound and the dollar, is what's called is a fiat currency. And here's the definition, according to Wikipedia, of a fiat currency. So as long as the government recognise that the £10 note is a £10 note, you try and take an Italian, take 10,000 lira, I lived in Italy during the time of the lira, you take 10,000 lira into a store in Italy now to buy something, they won't accept it. So it's worth the paper that was printed on. So if you look into the history of money, you'll discover that money is just a bit of paper, and it's just worth the paper that it's on. What really counts is the gold and silver. And now this is the really, really interesting part of it. If we look at the value of an ounce of silver over 2,000 years, in ancient Rome, which is what that guy is, you see the way that guy's dressed? In ancient Rome, you could walk into a store with one ounce gold coin and you'd suit yourself up in a business suit, the equivalent business suit of the day. Today, one ounce of gold, which is equivalent to $1,210, which is about 771 pounds, you can walk into a store and kit yourself out with shoes, belt, tie, everything that you need to dress yourself ready for business. So what have we noticed? We've noticed that over 2,000 years, the value, the real value of an ounce of gold has actually not changed. It's not changed. But what's happened to the value of the pound, the value of the dollar, over time? It's gone down in value. And that's because they keep printing money. Now, you imagine uh, playing Monopoly. And you know that Monopoly has a certain amount of money in each box. And you start playing Monopoly with your friends. And so the value of the properties on the board is worth so much. Then suddenly another friend comes along and says, oh, I've got more money here in another box of Monopoly. Let's throw that in. As soon as that other money comes into the game, what's going to happen to all the value of the properties now that everybody's got more money in their pockets? It's going to go up. And that's exactly what inflation is. But it's piloted by these people from the Federal Reserve. It's not the government. It's these private individuals. So look into it. I'm not saying take this information that I'm giving you as truth, okay? Take it as inspiration to go and find out more about it and think carefully about what really is going on in the world and not what BBC TV or CNN or ESPN or whoever news channel you watch is telling you. So, next thing. There's a lot of the media, when they talk about people with money, they talk about them in a bad way. And I find this, I mean, they're only talking about 2 to 3% of the rich people on earth. The 97%, and I work with a lot of these people because I sell them private jets. And I can tell you, they're really nice people. Very few of them are annoying. Most of them are really nice people. So this whole concept of, of rich people being evil is actually not true. Because most rich people are very nice people. So let's bear that one in mind. But the media don't tell you that story, do they? They always tell you that they've got ten wives, and that there was a book in, in the States a few years ago called The Millionaire Next Door, and this guy went out and he interviewed all these millionaires, and he discovered that most of them have been married to the same woman all their lives, or the same man all their lives. They had a, they had a nice family, and they, they drove nice cars, but again, they were nice people in general. So this whole concept, again, of rich people being... I mean, we only read about a few of them in the press. Most of them like to hide their wealth, and I think that's the best way to do it. Prosperity. Now, this is an interesting one, because the word prosperity comes from Latin. And this is the way I like to look at it. It means to be in the flow. So when people say to me, I want to become rich or wealthy, I say, what we, need to sh we should be aspiring to is prosperity. Because if you're prosperous, you're healthy, you're happy, and you're wealthy. You've got all three. What you don't want to be is you don't want to have a lot of money and then suddenly be unhealthy and then die of cancer or some other thing or whatever or end up having four divorces and being really unhappy. You see a lot of these people in the news, they show, think of Elvis Presley, he was one of the greatest singers that's ever been on earth, and, and look what happened to him. Look at also recent people, uh, Whitney Houston, uh, and other famous singers that decided to take their lives. It's very sad that this happens. Now these people had a lot of notoriety, they were famous, they had a lot of money, but they weren't prosperous. 
So prosperity is what we need to be aiming for, so that we are in the flow. Now media. We've got the usual media, the newspapers, the TV, and today we've got the internet. And with the internet, we can really be drowning in information. Because you can go there and Google and YouTube and you can be on there for hours. And hours and hours. And then you're wondering to yourself, is this guy telling me the truth or is the other guy telling me the truth? Who's telling me the truth? And you could be wasting a lot of time as well. So when we're looking at information, we need to think, how is this information going to serve me? How is this going to, information going to get me from where I am today to where I want to go? Health. This is an interesting subject. Very close to my heart because my wife a few years ago had cancer and she went to a doctor and he said you know I need to operate you in 48 hours because I think you're going to die and she thought to herself you know what I bet you there's a herbal remedy out there I bet you there's another way I'm not going to go for this operation or chemotherapy or whatever so my wife went out there and she discovered another way and the thing that inspired us to do this was the fact that the pharmacies are full of medicines and the hospitals are full of sick people so I said to myself well then, why? I mean, these medicines are in the pharmacy. They're supposed to make people better. Why are they queuing up to get into hospital then? There must be something wrong with the system. And so as we delved into it, and we discovered that they, this school of natural healing in, in Utah, in the United States, this gentleman here is, is David Christopher Jr., the son of a famous herbalist called John Christopher, John R. Christopher, very interesting guy. And he's cured all sorts of things. You know, they say, oh, we're looking for the cure for cancer. You know, you get these people, you go to Tesco's, and they say, oh, would you like to donate some money for the cure for cancer? You know what? Cure for cancer's been out there for 80 years. And what my wife did, she went on a raw, vegan, plant-based diet for three months. We were already vegan, so we weren't eating meat or dairy. And she worked out with a personal trainer. She prayed. She, she, she did all this positive stuff. And she had this cyst, which was that big, a ovarian cyst, and it was turning into a cancer. In, and this is what the doctor would say. He said, oh, this is really bad, really bad. And within three weeks, that cyst went down to six centimetres, and three months later, it had gone completely. And that's because she changed the way she was eating. So it was the food that you're putting on your plate that was actually killing you. So a lot of these diseases that people have today is to do with the food. But, you know, you go to the supermarket, you think, well, you know, it's on the shelf in the supermarket. I actually saw it advertised on ITV yesterday, so it must be good for you. Yeah, but wait a minute. Is it really good for you? Question. You need to find the answer. So... We discovered, as we researched this subject, that the most important organ in the body is your colon. Now, the photograph to the bottom there, this is what a healthy colon looks like, and that, at the top is what uh, an unhealthy colon looks like. And that will depend on the food that you eat. It's important to exercise, it's important to eat the right food, and it's also important to use herbs that can keep your colon clean. Because if your colon is clean, then your mind is going to be clean. And looking at the body, and those Chinese students that are here in the room will understand this probably better than others. In Chinese medicine, they look at the body, and also in Indian Ayurvedic medicine, they look at the body as a whole. Not, oh, I've got a poor little finger, or I've hurt my knee. We've got to look at the body as a whole. Because anything that you do to the body will affect other areas as well. So we discovered the colon is the most important organ in the body. It's not the brain, it's not the heart, which is what most people think. It's actually the colon. So, what do we eat? And this is the pyramid that we follow. A plant-based diet, as much raw fruit and vegetables as possible. And again, you're probably thinking, well, then what do you eat? Where do you get your protein from? Which is the number one question people always ask. You get protein from coconuts. You get protein from all sorts of green vegetables as well. If you look into it, if you do your research, you'll discover a whole new world. But above all, you'll have more energy. And when you have more energy, your brain functions better, you perform better, you achieve your goals. So health is really, really important element. Now this is an interesting guy, Marcus Rothkranz, who we personally know. This is what Marcus looked like when he was 27. He worked in Hollywood. He worked in film production. He was one of the video guys, did all the editing and this stuff. And this is what he looked like when he was 27 years old. And he was really, really sick. He had all sorts of problems with himself. Then he discovered the raw vegan diet and he changed himself. And this is what he looks like now. You think they're two different people, but it's the same guy. So if you can go from that to that, 20 years later you look younger than you did when you were 27. 
That was done because of the food that he was eating. But above all, he changed his mindset first, and because he changed his mindset, it allowed him to change the way he ate, because he went out there to look for the information, bring it in, apply it, and that's the result. So attitude. It's your attitude. More than your aptitude that's going to determine your altitude. So this attitude, you imagine the cube, and every side of the cube, if you were to press it, it wouldn't open. The only way to open the cube, and, and you're stuck in this cube, okay? So you imagine you're stuck in this cube, and the only way out is if someone presses the attitude button. But actually, it's not pressed from the outside, it's you on the inside pressing it. So when my wife had her cancer, and the doctor said, I have to operate or you're going to die, like, the only option is you get operated or you're going to die, she had a different way of thinking. And it's a different way of thinking. You think of Chuck Yeager, what did he do? He flew the plane in a different way. And he got a different result. And it's all started with the attitude. So it's really, really important. And one of the elements of attitude is grit. If you don't know what grit is, I came up with a definition. You see this kid that shows you what grit is? Grit is growth. So if you're in a situation which is difficult, okay, you're trying to achieve a goal, or you're working out in the gym, or you're working towards an Olympic gold medal or whatever, you need to be growing every day, mentally and physically, spiritually, emotionally. You need to be growing. So am I growing? Am I learning? Am I making mistakes? Making mistakes is great. They say mistakes is a signpost on the road to victory. So you keep seeing these, these, these signposts that says mistake, mistake, mistake. But every time you see that signpost mistake, question, what have I learned? And if you have learned something, and I guarantee you will, guess what? You're growing. You're becoming a better person. And that's really key. Next thing is resilience. What's resilience? Resilience is when they knock you down, you get up. So when you're knocked down, you need to get up. And again, ask yourself that question. Why was I knocked down? What did I do wrong? What can I learn from this situation? Integrity. Integrity is more the integrity with yourself. So if you're aiming to achieve a certain goal, whether it's developing a business or something in sport, or even ex excelling at your exams here at Lancaster University, you need to keep on, the, on course with that goal. I set that goal. I really want to achieve that goal. Let me keep going. And then the C is tenacity. You've got to have that tenacity. I'm going to keep at it. You speak to anybody that's climbed Mount Everest, you speak to anybody that's won a gold medal at the Olympic Games, and they will tell you that the training was not easy. They had to get up early every morning and run and run and go to the gym and do this over and over again for four years until they went to the Olympic Games. They need to have that tenacity to wake up at five o'clock in the morning and open your curtains and see it snowing, it's raining, snowing, whatever it's doing outside, the temperature's zero degrees, and I have to go running for 10 miles. Oh, I better go back to bed. No, the Olympic winner, Olympic gold medal winner, says to themselves, you know what, I want that gold medal. I don't care what the weather's like, I'm going for it. It's their tenacity. So the grit, the growth, the resilience, the integrity, the tenacity is your grit. That's what makes someone a champion, whether it's business, whether it's life. It's that grit, because challenges are going to come. They come to everybody. And it's the grit that gets you over the obstacle. You can do it, but you need to find it. You need to find the why. And we'll get into the why in a minute. Now, this is a gentleman I met back about 23 years ago. I was working for an com American company called Herbalife International. And what they did is they produced this, this weight loss product. And uh, I built a business very quickly with Herbalife. I was making about $10,000 a month, for, which for a 22-year-old would be good money even today because it's about 6,500 pounds. Um, I had a, a group of salespeople in my what's called downline of 5,000 people spread over five to six different countries. And one of the people that was training us was Jim Rohn. And Jim Rohn was an incredible guy. I, I encourage you all to tune in. He, he passed away a few years ago. But tune in to Jim Rohn. You can see his videos on YouTube. You can buy his audio tapes. You, you can read his books. Very, very interesting gentleman. And one of the things he said in order to accelerate success is, is tune in to OPE which is other people's experience. Which doesn't necessarily mean you have to go to Richard Branson's house tomorrow morning, knock on the door and say, hi Richard, can I have breakfast with you? I've got a business problem, a business idea. Can I sit down? Because you're not going to get to him. But what you can do, you can go online and purchase the books that he's written. And you can read his books. 
And you can do the same. You can go to the library. Library is free. Library cards free. It doesn't cost anything. Library is full of books. And in those books, there's a lot of wisdom. There's a lot of experience from people that walked the earth before you have that you can learn from. I mean, we looked at, we looked at the story of Chuck Yeager before. We talked about Elon Musk and, and Tesla Motors. We talked about Christopher Columbus. You can meet those people through their life stories and find out, did this guy have grit? What obstacles and challenges did he or she have in, in, in her life or his life? And how did they overcome it? So if you tune in to other people's experience, you can learn a lot. I mean, you're here this evening, and what you're doing, basically, is you're tuning into my experience. And, and everything I'm telling you this evening is not something I came up with. I learned this from other people. And I'm just here this evening, hopefully, to inspire you and give you a bit of motivation, inspiration, to be able to go out there and make a difference to this world. Because the leaders of tomorrow are in this room. We could very well be here this evening with the next Steve Jobs, the next Elon Musk, the next Christopher Columbus. Could very well be one of you. But it all starts up here. So Jim says, other people's experience. It's one of the things that Jim taught me. But he taught me many other things as well. But this is really, really incredible because you can learn so much more by tuning into other people's experience. And if you get to sit at a table with one of these people and pick their brains, it's even better. And again, leaders are readers. So you can tune into the books, you can tune into the videos, and now you've got Google, you've got the internet. So once you've got an internet connection, you're in. And all that information is there. So you can tune in and find out about these people. Two books that really changed my life in the past few years. One was Richestan and one was Lynchpin. And I'll tell you the story of these two books and why it affected me. At the time, I was flying Boeing 737s for a company in the Middle East. And I was flying day and night, and I was really tired. And my career was sort of at a stage where if I went any further, it was going to be interesting, but the money wasn't going to be that much. And it was going to end up being positions within the airline, which have created quite big headaches. Cause, and I knew this because friends of mine had been chief pilots, chief training captains, and stuff like that. And they told me, you know, I always wanted this position, but now I'm here. I can't wait to leave because it's really a bit of a headache. So I knew if I continued this career, I knew what was ahead of me. And I knew that if I wanted to transit onto a larger aircraft, I would have been flying long distance, I would have been away from my family, I would have been going through time zones, and it, th there were lots of interesting things that could have happened. But above all, I would have been really, really tired. So I was sort of saying to myself, I need to do something different. So I came across the book Richestan, which is a very interesting study. Uh, that this Robert Frank did. He went out there and he wanted to discover how rich people spend their money. So he went out and interviewed all these people and he found out that they have aeroplanes, they have houses, they, they usually live in more than one house, and, and, and a number of interesting things. One of the things that he said in his book that really struck me, because he, he calls Richestown this, like, like this nation of rich people. And because they live in more than one country, this nation is like a mobile nation. And he said, if you want to join that nation, one thing you should do is create a business that services these people. So it's like selling diamonds, yachts, planes. Oh, planes. Oh, planes. I know about aeroplanes. Oh, that's interesting. And then a few weeks later, I came across this book called Lynchpin. I started reading Lynchpin. Seth Godin, I don't know if any of you have heard of him. He's written a number of management and business books. It's very interesting. And in Lynchpin, he talks about the Lynchpin, which you imagine a machine, okay? And machines have these cogs in the wheel, which when they break, they're very easy to replace. And then some machines have a Lynchpin. Now, the Lynchpin has more than one function. It usually has four or five different functions. So within a company, the Lynchpin is something which is indispensable. It's something that you can't replace. And in the book, Seth Godin talks about different professions that are out there that are easily replaceable. And one of the professions he mentions is the pilot. He said, you know, pilot flies a plane. If he resigns, they replace him with another pilot. Because all he does is fly a plane. And I thought, well, actually, different airlines I've worked for, when I resigned, what did they do? They replaced me with somebody else. So I'm easily replaceable. And he said, those professions that are easily replaceable are the ones that are going to earn the less money. Oh. Interesting. So then it dawned on me why pilot salaries over the last 15 years have never gone up. They've stayed the same. But obviously everything else has gone up in, in, in price. So once upon a time, 15, 20 years ago, where you'd be a pilot, you'd be flying 25 hours a month and earning five, six thousand pounds. Happy days. It's not like that anymore. 
these guys are flying like crazy. I was flying like crazy when I was out in, in, in the Middle East. And I was really tired because I was flying day and night and everything. So these two books got me thinking. And because I sold aircraft in my 20s, I sold my first jet when I was 23 years old. Talking to my wife, she said, well, you sold a jet when you were 23, so you can do it now in your 40s. I thought, oh, maybe I can. So I, I did a bit of market research to find out what Boeing was saying, what Airbus was saying, the private jet manufacturers were saying about how the market was going to go. And because of the internet, the internet is revolutionizing the way we do business. Because today, for example, when my wife needs to buy a dress for my daughter, she doesn't go downtown Chorley in Lancashire where we live and buy a dress from there. She goes online, eBay, buys one from China, pays £12 for a dress, great quality, including shipping costs and everything. If she'd gone downtown to Marks and Spencers, she would have probably spent 30, 40, maybe 50 pounds. She gets a dress which is better in quality and gets shipped from China and arrives in two weeks. So now, the shopkeeper <coughs> downtown Shirley is in competition with somebody in Shanghai because of the internet. And then obviously, that dress needs to get here somewhere. How does it get here? On an airplane. So obviously, as, as internet goes on and on and on, and more people connect with other people through the internet. I met my business partner through LinkedIn. I didn't know Jeff Andrews. We connected on LinkedIn, then we did a Skype call, we started talking, he was trying to start a plane business over in America, I was trying to get it going over here, I was struggling a bit, he was struggling a bit. I said, Jeff, why don't we join forces and just become one company? You know, America, England, kind of sounds right, two aviation nations of the world, and we started doing business. So the internet is incredible, it's revolutionizing the way we do business. So I knew that there'll be more and more airplanes sold in the next 20 to 30 years. So I said, okay, there's a market there, and it's something that I know, because I know how to fly them, I know how they work, and I'm good at business as well, because I've proved it in the past. When in my 20s I sold a jet, in my 20s I built a successful network marketing business with Herbalife, so I knew I had a knack for business. So I thought, let's combine my passion for business with my passion for airplanes, and created Tyrus Wings. We didn't make any money the first eight months, and we're kind of, ooh, this is not going very well. And it wasn't an easy situation, but that's where I had to get, my grit came back into it. And I was fortunate enough to have a wife that backed me all the way. Otherwise, we would have said, you know what, go down Tesco's and start stacking shelves, because, you know, we've got to put food on the table here. But I kept at it, and then after eight months, we struck the first deal, the second deal, and before we, before we arrived to month 12, we actually did. 70 million dollars worth of business. And if it hadn't been for that grit, and if it hadn't been for that atmosphere that I had around me of my family, which is a positive atmosphere that we've created at home, with my kids, with my wife and everything, that was so important for me, to have that comfort, to know that those around me loved me and they were backing my dream. So creating that environment, creating that atmosphere is very, very important because it will help you with, 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 your, with your mindset. Now, I've come up with this little story that I'd like to tell you. Now imagine all of you came to Earth as babies with this suitcase. You arrive with this suitcase and you open the suitcase, and in the suitcase you have a clock. And the clock symbolizes the 24 hours a day that each one of us has. You agree that we all have 24 hours a day? Anybody have more than 24 hours a day here? No, we all have 24 hours a day. So that's the first thing that we have. Second thing, we have talents. Now these guys up here, remember these guys that were playing before in the YouTube video? These are the piano guys. These are five dads from St. George, Utah, which is an outback place in the middle of the United States. One of them had a piano store. They started mucking around on their piano one day in the store, just messing around. One guy filmed it, put it on YouTube, it got a few hits. They said, let's take the piano and put it in the desert and make a video. They took the piano, they put it in the desert, they made a video, and they got millions of hits. Millions of hits. And a phone call from Sony Records. And now they're world famous. And they're not 20 years old. 45, 50 years old, these dads. But they had a talent for music. So we all come to earth with a certain number of talents. Some come with five, some come with two, some come with 20. And this is the other problem with society today, is that the system, as I call it, teaches you to compare yourself to the guy sitting next to you, or the girl sitting next to you. Oh, she's more beautiful than me. Oh, he makes more money than I do. Oh, he got a better score at his exam than I did. Wrong! Because you should be concentrating on the talents that you have, 
Discover the talents you have and use them and develop them. That's the name of your game. You've got 24 hours a day to do this. The other person you probably all know, Zoella, very famous on YouTube, she started posting videos. The girls are laughing at She started posting videos of her putting her makeup on. She's been getting two, three, four, ten million hits on her videos. She's making an absolute fortune. Her book that came out last week sold 78,000 copies in the first week. Is she a marketing guru? Is she a singer or whatever? They even called her to sing in the band aid. They recorded the, the band aid song 12, 30 years later and they called her to sing in the choir with all these famous singers because of all her hits on YouTube. So again, she knew she had a talent there for talking and making videos and talking about her life and she just posted it on YouTube and now she's making a fortune. So again, she, she tapped into what she had and that's what we need to be doing. And the other thing is that free will. We have the choice. We choose how to use those 24 hours a day with the talents that we've been given. So, number one, how many talents do I have? Number two, what are they? Number three, let me see how I can use them in the most effective way. So let's see in 24 hours a day how I can use my talents to make me happier, richer, and aim towards that prosperity. Prosperity is the name of the game. The health, the wealth, and the happiness together makes you prosperous. It gets you in the flow, which is the key. So it's not what you do, but why you do. Why you do it. So if you're going to set up a business venture, like most of you are aspiring to do, it's not, I'm going to, put, I'm going to set up that business because I'll make a lot of money. No, wrong. You have to set up a business that you're passionate about. You need to set up a business that's something to do with something to do with your talents. Okay? So it's one of your talents that you're using to then make money. Of course, it has to be something that's going to be sold. So you're not going to set up something that nobody wants. So you're going to do your market research. Make sure there's a need out there. Okay? Which doesn't necessarily mean, because when Steve Jobs created Apple and he created the iPad and all these lovely devices and everything, he didn't go out there with focus groups. No, he thought, you know something? I'm going to create something and this technology people are going to want. So he, he had a vision, but he had that talent and he developed that talent. But there was a why behind it, okay? He had a strong why. The why is really, really important. And I call the why your fuel. So you imagine this airplane is doing an air-to-air -air refueling, okay? The why, why you do something is the key. Now, we're going to do a little, we're going to play a little game here with everybody. So I want everybody to stand up. Stand up, everybody. Stand up. I want you to spread out because you're going to need a little bit of space to do this. So we've got, we've got room in the, in the room. So just come to the front, okay? Because you're all going to need some space. So just come down here as well, okay? Yeah, just get space over here. Okay, I want you to spread out. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to put your right arm, your right arm out in front of you, okay? And I want you to swing your right arm to the right or clockwise as it's also said. So just swing it to the right and stop. Okay, can you see how far it goes? You're happy how far it went? Okay, great. Now, come back again. Now, put your, your arms down like this. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to close your eyes. Everybody close your eyes. And I want you to imagine, only in your imagination, only in your mind, I want you to imagine this arm, this right arm out in front of you. And only in your imagination, what I want you to do now is I want you to swing that arm to the right, or clockwise as we say, twice as far as it went before. Only in your mind, I want you to feel it. Okay? I want you to feel this arm go twice as far. Okay, now bring the arm back again. Now put the arm out in front. No, only in your mind. Put the arm out in front of you, only in your mind, okay? Now I want you to swing that arm to the right or clockwise as we say. I want you to do it three times further than it went before. Okay, one, two, three, off it goes. Okay, now I want you to open your eyes, everybody. Open your eyes, open your eyes, open your eyes. Arm out in front. One, two, three, to the right. Okay, what happened? Question to you. What happened? I went further than the first time. It went further. Everybody sit down. Now, I made you do that first before I explain what actually happened. Because this little exercise it's something that I was taught a while back by this gentleman. Well, let me explain this first. 
This is an approach plate, okay? Frequency is what I want to talk about, okay? Because this is what we just did now. I made you tune into the right frequency. This is what a pilot has in front of him or her, okay? It's a bit like a sheet of music, and there's all the frequencies on there that you dial into this thing here. You put these frequencies down, okay? Which is the control tower, the instrument landing system. You need to put the right frequency in, okay? If you don't put the right frequency in, you can't speak to the control tower. Control tower can't give you clearance to land. But more importantly, if you don't put the right navigation frequency in, you're not going to be navigating correctly, and you may end up going lower than the glide path and crashing into an obstacle or a mountain. And that's happened quite a few times. And this is what happens actually in the airplane. The display over here on your right-hand side is what the pilot mainly uses, okay, which gives them the speed and, and, and heading and everything, and follow, follows this, this cross, which tells them and uh, that tells them they're on the right glide and um, right heading in order to land the aircraft. So what you, they're doing here, the pilot is tuning in to the right frequencies. Okay. Now the reason why your arm didn't go as further as it did the first time compared to the, the second time is because I tuned in a different frequency to you. Okay. I made you dial in a different frequency and it was dialing in that frequency into your mind that you got a better result. So that's really important. So Bob Proctor is the gentleman that introduced me to this concept. I met Bob uh, a few years ago in London. I was speaking at an event when I launched my book. This was 10 years ago. And Bob was speaking at that event as well. And Bob is a big self-development uh, uh, guru, as they, as they call it. He's written a number of books and a number of courses, The Science of Getting Rich and, and, and other things, which is very, very interesting. You can tune into Bob Proctor online. There's many, many videos of him on there. And he explains what he does and, and how he works. And what, he, what Bob did is he said to me, he said, for Richard, he said, the mind, what is the mind? Can you draw the mind? And he drew the mind for me. And he said, the mind is you. It's not here. It's you. And then he said, the mind is divided into two. You've got the conscious mind and the unconscious mind. Now, when we go to school, when we, we get information, the information goes into the conscious mind. But what actually dictates our actions is the subconscious mind, which is driven by emotions. And the word emotion itself contains the word motion, which is action. So when you are emotionally engaged with something, whether it's positive or negative, that is what will determine your results. So if you decide to set up a business, and you, you have the money, you have the product, off you go, but in your mind, you're not emotionally positive, you're not emotionally engaged, the action is not going to be an action which is going to bring you positive results. And it all starts in the mind. But... How most people think? They think with an in the cube attitude. And this is the thing. What dictates what they do with their results? So for example, take someone that's poor. What do they say to themselves? I'm poor. I set up five businesses in the last five years. And I failed at every single one. I'm a failure. This is what they say. This is, this is the subconscious mind. That's the feeling that they're getting. So the result determines the result is what they look at. And that result makes them think in a negative way. So if I'd said to you before, instead of moving your hand twice as far or three times as far, if I said half as far, it would have gone half as far. Because it's all up here. So this is what's happening. So the results is they're poor, they, they've been a failure of business, this is what they're thinking. That brings these negative emotions, and the negative emotions brings the actions, which then brings the negative results. This is why the poor people keep becoming poorer and poorer. This is why people that fail keep failing and failing and failing. But you can change. You can change. And a lot of the reasons why these people fail, if we think of the five sides of the queue, the atmosphere, the education, the whole money thing, the health thing, the whole system, the way it's designed, is to make people fail. Because if people fail, I can control them. If people succeed, and, and, and decide to make a difference, I can't control those people. Okay? So, leadership is based on thinking outside the queue. So how are we going to reverse this process? We've got to think outside the queue. And so how do we do that? Success, and the key to success, is starting with your thoughts. So instead of looking at your results, what you need to do is look at the results and ask yourself the question, why did I fail at those businesses? Now, over the last 18 months, after Tyrus Wings launched and was successful, we launched another two ventures. 
the, one venture was in the classic car business and one was in the golf events business. I personally put money into both of those ventures and both ventures failed. So I could say, well, I succeeded at one out of three. Okay, that's good. But I said to myself, why did those two other ventures fail? And the reason why it failed is I, I basically hired the wrong people. The two business partners I had in those two businesses, they weren't the right people to make this business succeed. So we lost, we lost quite a bit of money on those two ventures. Okay? But the, the lesson I learned is I should have spent more time trying to find out more about the mindset of these two people. Because one of them had, a, had been successful in business in the past. And I thought, well, I'll back this guy because he's got a track record. The problem was he hadn't updated himself. And now with the internet on here, you need to be doing something online. Social media is so important. Learning to use social media and connect with people all over the world with social media. I mean, you're here today, and there's people from all over the world in this room right now. And that's fantastic. Because once you guys graduate, you'll probably go back to your own countries or go elsewhere. And you, probably in five years' time, you'll be spread out across the world. But guess what? You can still be connected. You can be connected through Facebook. You can post photographs, stuff on there, connect via LinkedIn, do a YouTube video, show people what you're up to, show people what business you've just, you've just launched and whatever. And you guys are in school together. So you can keep that relationship going. So social media is so important. So going back to the thinking outside the queue, so even if you have failed in the past, you need to look at what you have learned from those failures, and now those lessons become a positive. And then you have to have a vision. Why am I doing this? What's this going to be like in five to ten years' time? And create a vision board. I, I, in my house, we have vision boards. So what we do is we cut out what we'd like to have, what we'd like to achieve, and put it on a board. And we, and we look at this vision board every day, the dream house, the plane, the yacht, whatever you want to aspire to, have your own family, all, this, all these kind of goals that you may have. It's important to aim high. My father was said to me, he said, I left Italy when I was 20 years old, he was in a small town just outside a place called Ascolupacino, which is on the east coast of, of Italy. And his mum was a simple lady, she didn't have much of an education. She said to my father, she said, Angelo, you're going to a foreign land, you don't speak the language, but do one thing please, my son. Mix with successful people. Mix with people that are better than you. Because that will rub off on you. And my father taught me this, he said to me all the time, he said, remember wherever you go, tune into the successful people. When you go into a new company, a new organization, or a new business, tune into those that have got there before you and find out how. The other people's experience that Jim Rohn talks about. It's so important because that's going to help you with your thoughts, with your mindset. Because you say, it's actually possible. I'm tuning into Zoella. Look what Zoella has done. Incredible. Okay, look what the piano guys have done. Look what Elon Musk has done. Look what Steve Jobs has done. There's people out there doing stuff. Young people as well. Mark Zuckerberg started Facebook in his 20s. And look where he is now, he's one of the richest people in the world. But he had a vision, he had ideas, he thought outside the cube. So it's those thoughts, those positive thoughts, that positive environment around you that's going to create those thoughts. Like you thought of the arm going three times further, and it did. It was the thinking. It's that's where it needs to start. Because those thoughts are going to excite you. That excitement creates those feelings. How am I going to feel when I live in that nice villa? How am I going to feel when I can see my book on the bookshelves in a bookstore in Toronto? And I walk in there and I see my book on the bookshelf. How am I going to feel? Okay, and it's those feelings. So run those images in your mind. How are you going to feel? Because it's the feeling, the emotion, that's going to create the motion, the action. And the action would then turn into results. And you will hit obstacles. There will be people that tell you it can't be done. There will be banks that will tell you they're not going to lend you money. There will be all sorts of doors shut in your face. That's going to happen. But what's going to keep you going is that grit, that determination. That's what's going to keep you going. But above all, it's the why. Why am I doing this? The vision, what it's going to be like when you achieve that goal. That's what kept me going, the tire of swings. It wasn't easy. We hit many obstacles. But we kept going. And you need to keep going. And if you haven't got the solution, tap into other people's experience. And in closing, here we go, this is the environment around you. What you watch, who you listen to, what you read, will influence what you think, which will determine 
your actions. And that's pretty much the summary of what I've been talking to you about this evening. So watch what you listen to, what you're watching, the people around you, what ideas are put into your heads. Are these things going to create the positive image, those positive emotions in my life that's going to take me towards my goals? Because if it isn't, you've got to change environment, you've got to change what's going on in your head. So important. And because we live in a world today where we are bombarded with information more than ever, we've got to be careful. So I created this podcast show called Living Outside the Queue. We did 14 episodes last year, and we're just about to start up again. And the new episodes will be out in the new year. I've got some really interesting people I'm going to be interviewing. It's free. You can download it, listen to it for half an hour. We're going to do about two to three a month. We'll be interviewing successful business people and business and successful thinkers around the world. And we'll be releasing. There's already about 14 episodes available. You can find them on, 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 on the website. Um, and that's one thing you can tune into to learn about what other people are doing and, and tune into some positive news instead of CNN or BBC. And in closing, so the progress of humankind, as you've seen and as we've talked about this evening, has always happened as a result of someone thinking and acting outside the cube. So you've got to be bold and be that someone.